Hello, good afternoon. This is Margaret Malloy of Siegel and Gale, and I'm joined by my colleague Brian Rafferty, our Global Director of Research and Insight. We are thrilled to be here with you this morning or this afternoon, depending on your location, to discuss the findings from our latest Global Brand Simplicity Index study. We launched the study, which is now in its fifth year. The report revealed how consumers rank leading brands, why disruptors are gaining ground, and what companies can gain by simplifying customer experience. The agenda is as follows. I'll provide a brief intro to who Siegel and Gale is, and then hand over to my colleague Brian, who will walk you through the methodology, the findings, and that discussion on what brands can gain from creating simpler customer experiences. I would please invite you to follow the conversation along on Twitter using hashtag SimplicityPays. We will have a moderated Q&A session in about half an hour. You may submit your Q&A through the system, or you may also try to submit them using that hashtag SimplicityPays, and I will aim to monitor both of those dashboards. So who is Siegel & Gale? We're a global strategic branding firm. We're probably best known as the Simplicity Company. And that is because for the past 40 years, we have been helping brands deliver customer experiences that are simpler. When we say simple, we mean experiences that are both remarkably fresh and unexpectedly clear. We define, design, and deliver these compelling brand experiences on behalf of our clients. And the final slide in my section outlines the scope of our services. We are a full service strategic branding firm. Brian will expose our research capabilities as well as our point of view in this, sec in this session. We also have a broad ranging capabilities in the areas of design, content, strategy, and digital experiences. May I now hand over to Brian to go through the findings from this year's study. Great. Thank you, Margaret. <coughs> and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, as Margaret told you, this is the fifth year that we've uh, done the Global Brand Simplicity Index. And uh, we have actually some, some first this year we uh, added a country. Um, we've done it, doing it in Sweden also uh, this year, as well as every year we try to explore further uh, topics related to simplicity and brands. And this year we looked into the topic of disruptors and how disruptor brands are doing. So I think you'll see we have some interesting findings to share in regards to those. Um, just to give you a, a quick overview of the methodology that these findings are based on. Um, so we ask people, this is consumers, um, to evaluate both brands and industries um, on a series of attributes. Um, and uh, we did it around with around 12,000 consumers globally, spread across um, the seven countries. It was actually eight countries. We have two countries in the Middle East that you see listed here. Um, and we looked both at how brands scored as well as how industries scored um, in relation to simplicity. So one of the, the big findings that we have related actually to, uh, to the hashtag simplicity pays um, is we've seen that actually simplicity does pay for brands. Um, a stock portfolio made out of the um, top brands every year. We sort of buy and sell this portfolio every year and look at how it uh, performs versus the major indices. And as you can see, uh, year on year, it really has outperformed all of the major indices. So simplicity definitely um, at least uh, drives good stock performance or relates to good stock performance. We also see that simplicity um, improves loyalty as well as can increase margins. Um, there's a simplicity premium where people are actually willing to um, pay more for simpler brands or brands that deliver simpler experiences. So one thing we see is that 70% uh, of consumers are more likely to recommend a brand if it provides simpler experiences and communications. 
Um, as many of you know, you know the Net Promoter Score is a, a score that's related to uh, brand loyalty, how likely people are to recommend the brand, relates to how likely they are to continue shopping for a brand. And so we see that 70% uh, you know, of people are more likely to, to recommend a brand if it is simpler. Another new finding this year is we actually looked at um, what was the difference in terms of how people were looking for information in between of what they looked for within complex industries and within simple industries. And we saw that people were two times more likely to actually want to talk to a live person or customer representative in complex industries when they were looking for information and in simpler ones. So there's definitely also a cost related to complexity and lack of simplicity. Related to the premium, we saw that 38% of people, just if they are asked if they'd be willing to pay more, say that they'd be willing to pay more if brands provided simpler experiences. And as you'll see as we go further into the findings, we have some interesting um, findings between the relationship of how simple people see certain brands and how willing they are to pay a premium for those brands if they get even simpler. Another finding this year um, is that some German brands did very well. As you uh, probably all know, Germany won the, the World Cup in, uh, in soccer or football, as it's uh, called in Europe. Um, but uh, German brands also did very well from a simplicity standpoint. Aldi was the, the number one brand. Miele and Lidl were also in the top ten. Um, and we've seen that these brands actually have really leverage simplicity in order to beat out their competition, um, especially Aldi and Lidl throughout uh, Europe and now even coming to America in the case of Aldi have really been beating lots of their peers by delivering a really pared down uh, experience, but one that actually delivers on its promises pretty ruthlessly. Another interesting finding related to simplicity in brands um, happens when you look at social media brands um, and you see that the, the ones that appear to be most focused and, or sort of more singularly focused, such as, for example, Instagram, do very well. And the, and the social media brands that have a broader um, purview or a broader uh, business actually have a harder time um, being simple, where LinkedIn uh, particularly, for example, is, is not doing so well and hasn't done well in, in many years, part of it being the people actually have a harder time really understanding what its purpose is for them outside of when they're, they're looking for work. Um, another interesting finding in the top of the listings is the battle between Netflix and Amazon. Um, you know, Netflix is expanding in more and more countries um, and uh, became a global brand for the, the first time this year and are really uh, doing quite well, uh, leaving Amazon to catch up. Obviously, again, Amazon obviously having a business that is much broader than just the streaming business of Netflix, but that is always one of the challenges for brands is the more businesses they're in, the, the bigger the challenge to remain simple and to continue to deliver simple experiences. Um, an interesting finding every year, we look at how industries um, rate versus each other in different countries, and there are a lot of uh, similarities, but then also some noteworthy differences. So as you see, health insurance and general insurance is seen as complex pretty much everywhere. The one place where health insurance does a little better is in Germany, where it actually uh, rises a, a bit out of the bottom of the rankings. But in every other country, it's really seen as one of the most complex industries and you know, delivering very complex um, experiences. Another interesting change more towards the top of the chart here is if you look at shipping and mail as well as internet retail, both of those are more complex in the Middle East and obviously um, in relation to each other in the sense that if shipping in, um, is harder in the Middle East, obviously internet retail also then is harder. So um, a section that every year everybody actually finds quite interesting uh, is uh, look at, well, who's winning? And sometimes even more interesting, who's lagging or who's, who's, who's losing the simplicity wars. And um, if you look at the top 10 brands globally, um, as, you, as you saw earlier, there are some German brands. Aldi is number one. Google, uh, you know, a brand that people often forget about uh, being founded really on the concept of simplicity with that ser simple search bar that they have maintained and protected throughout the years, also does very well. 
um, as do some of the uh, fast serve brands like McDonald's and Subway, as well as um, IKEA. Now, looking at the bottom of, inde of the index, so sort of these are the, the brands that are at the bottom. Linked to what you saw from an industry standpoint, um, it's a mixture of insurance, um, LinkedIn, as you saw in social media, but also um, rental car, which does quite poorly with Hertz budget and Avis being at the bottom, banking, as well as Ryanair um, as an airline that um, actually last year was, was at the bottom, this year has managed to come up one spot, but um, is seen as not delivering on its promises of, um, of being cheap and, and delivering experiences that really make it complex for travelers. Now looking at the, the US list, um, and we have lists for each of the countries that we put into the study. Um, it's always interesting for me actually looking at some of the countries I'm less familiar with, um, such as Sweden or China, uh, to, to recognize sometimes brands that um, until I do this study, I, I wouldn't know. But looking at the US, you see um, Zappos and Amazon, that, you know, number one and two. So obviously, given that Amazon owns Zappos, a, a great benefit for them. And um, uh, some of the uh, grocers that have been founded on the idea of simplicity, like Trader Joe's, also doing very well, having a streamlined portfolio, only giving the people who shop there a limited amount of choices or just the right amount of choices, thereby making their shopping experience simpler. If we look at the US and some of the brands at the bottom of the index, again, we see um, health insurance uh, with uh, pretty much all of the, the health insurance brands that we have in the study in the US hugging uh, the, you know, the bottom of the list, but then also um, cable uh, with Time Warner, Comcast, and DISH, as well as um, cell phone companies or, or cell service companies like AT&T and Verizon being at the bottom. Um, lots of um, these, the, the cable and cell phone brands being at the bottom is related really to the, the complexity of the plans and people not really understanding the variety of plans and feeling that the plans are often not being designed for them but for the benefit of the company, as well as having a lot of questions when it comes to the billing and the detail that they see in the billing and not understanding that. So as I told you earlier, one of the, uh, the really interesting additions this year is um, we thought we should look at some brands that we hadn't looked at previously. So um, up until now, the, the brands we have always put into the index was looking at 25 categories, industries, if you will, of services and, and um, taking the, the top five from a size or presence in each of those categories in any given country from a brand standpoint, and that's what made the brand list. And so this year we decided, well, let's go look at smaller brands, brands that are really just coming up, but that are getting a lot of attention because they're disrupting their category and, and doing things differently, leveraging technology um, in new ways. Uh, and in our view also, just from the outside, we thought, well, it, it also looks like they're using simplicity in order to disrupt. So let's see if we're correct in that and let's see how they do from a simplicity standpoint. And so we put, um, a lot of disruptors brands and had them scored in the same way that we, we scored um, the regular brands. And what we saw is that they really did phenomenally. And uh, you know, if we would put them all apples to apples, uh, the disruptors would have bumped lots of the brands out of the top 10 and really been the, the top brands from a simplicity standpoint from Grubhub to, to Uber. Also interesting number three there, Aereo, as you see um, a brand that uh, was seen as very simple, but unfortunately, like lots of these brands having facing regulatory issues and uh, not always having an easy time staying in business given the disruption they're creating. So what can we learn from these disruptors and from what we saw? Um, so they're really uh, a number of ways that they're managing to, to leverage simplicity and, and think about delivering simpler experiences and in that way disrupting their category. When they're you know, empowering people often sort of thinking about taking out, if you will, the middleman or middle experience and going straight to the to the consumer, enabling consumers to do things that they couldn't do before and before needed an intermediary for. They reimagine experiences. They take certain pain points and 
think, okay, well, how could we make this, instead of it being a pain point, let's make it a, a something that people actually take pleasure in doing. And the way they do that is by, you know, taking away a lot of those pain points and removing the friction or the or the hassles that can happen within a pain point. Uh, and ultimately, a lot of the benefits is actually saving people time. A lot of this, you know, making it easier on people is just enabling them to do something much faster than they could before. So really what we see is that simplicity, when it's, it's truly leveraged by brands, it can it can make life easier and it and it might it makes consumers' lives easier and that's really why it's something that resonates and sticks with them. So um, an interesting um, aspect to the study is for the, the consumers when they rate brands, if they rate a brand as particularly simple or as particularly complex, we ask them why. So we have a, a huge amount outside of the, the quantitative data. We have a lot of um, what's called in research terms open-end data, meaning uh, comments from people regarding what they thought was particularly simple about a brand or what they thought was complex. And here I'm just going to show you a few of the things they said about those top brands uh, from the disruptors. And what's interesting is it, it really is about, um, as we saw, removing those points of friction, making things so much easier. In the case of Grubhub um, and you know now Grubhub Seamless as, as they've come together, uh, as you see in this quote here, easy to learn, easy to use, experience is seamless and easy. So um, it's, it's really about not just ease of use, but also enabling people to come in and do things in ways that they hadn't done before, but in, in a very easy way. Um, same thing with uh, Uber, it's uh, you know, dependable, no need to have cash, you're already registered, you don't have to wait around for a taxi to pick you up, you don't have to find a taxi to pick you up. Again, all of these things uh, sort of changing the way actually people are using transportation in, in cities. Um, also in you know recent things that they've done enabling people to find each other, to ride together, and to, to actually um, share transportation in ways they hadn't before. And finally, as a, as a last example, Warby Parker, again, rated very high um, from a disruptor standpoint. And um, you know, what they've done is really revolutionize the way people can shop for glasses, finding a way by sending people um, four pairs to try on and also enabling them to try glasses on online ways for them to shop for glasses at home when beforehand they, they thought the only place I could really shop for glasses is a store. So again, finding ways to actually do things that um, had never been done before and thereby changing people's experiences through through making it simpler. So um, a, a further analysis we did this year is also looking at well, what can brands gain from greater simplicity? We've through the years, actually, I asked people, well, would you be willing to pay more? We actually even got a, have had for the last five years a premium that people would want to pay from a simple experiences standpoint. For the last two years, we've been asking them also by brand. So people who are users of a brand, would they be willing to pay more? And this year, we did a, an interesting further analysis on this that I think um, actually gives even more direction as to what certain brands can do from a, from a simplicity standpoint. So what we did is we, we looked at two things. We looked at how well does, it, does a brand score? So how currently are, are people seeing a brand as simple or not that simple? And then given that we've asked the people who use that brand, well, if this brand got simpler or delivered simpler experiences, would you be willing to pay more? And if they said yes, we asked them, well, how much of your monthly bill? And we gave them a, a number of actually quite small increments. Um, we can also then rank these brands depending on how much of a premium people are willing to pay going forward. So in some ways, there's the simplicity score, which is the state of the brand today from a simplicity standpoint, and then the simplicity premium, which is really its ability to, to leverage simplicity going forward as a, as a way to, to make money and to, to add revenue. And so the way we looked at these quadrants is there are a set of brands who are both that are seen as simple and also whose users are actually willing to pay much more if they continue to get simpler. And so these are brands we call striding that really can capitalize and profit on, on what they're doing from a simplicity standpoint. They're seen as simple. People believe they can get simpler. Um, there's really just further upside and um, uh, more things to capitalize on. They're really in, in, a, in a great spot. Then the brands that actually 
are afforded a high premium since people are saying, yes, no, I'd pay more if these brands delivered simpler experiences to me. However, they're currently not seen as all that simple. Um, and these are brands that, that we're calling slacking. I mean, it's brands that really need to focus on simplifying and, and cap capture this untapped premium. Um, it really means that there's low hanging fruit from a simplicity standpoint. People are there waiting for something and, um, and it's a question of focusing on it and, and delivering. Um, different quadrant, the one we're calling stalling, these are brands that actually are seen as quite simple. However, people aren't really seeing that they can simplify more, or at least they're not thinking that this is something that they'd be willing to pay that much more for. So does that mean that these brands shouldn't simplify? No, that, what that really means is they have to find a new way to deliver on simplicity, that in some ways the simplicity that they're perceived to have has become a bit of a given or a table stake, and that they obviously have to understand and will find ways to to leverage simplicity in more unexpected ways and ways that are going to be more delighting and more valuable to, to their consumers. And the last quadrant, the one we call snoozing, are ones that are seen as neither um, simple nor are they actually being afforded all that much of a, a premium going forward. Um, and those are brands that really should, should most worry about simplicity because really if they're seen not only as not having it, but then also as not even really being worth paying for if they got better at it, um, it really means that uh, there's a, a, a real trust bond that's probably broken with many of their customers regarding simplicity and what they can achieve. And so they really have to think about how can they go and really fix the, the complexity problems that they have or make it simpler for their customers in, in ways that are going to be seen as valuable. So how often in, in showing these um, findings and sharing these findings, um, I'm asked, well, you know, well, what can we do? What's the, how do you get simple? Uh, you know, how, do, how does a brand embark on getting simpler? And um, and there's no immediate easy answer because simplicity is actually not a, a simple thing to do. Simplicity is actually a hard thing to do and, um, and is a long term, requires a long term commitment. It's not just a one time fix. It's something that actually really requires long term commitment and, and attention. So there are a few steps, however, or a few questions that um, you can start with and, and have either answers to or work on getting answers to. The first is obviously you need to know your audience. You need to know your customers and prospects. And, and in our view, there are two really key things that you want to know. One, you want to know, well, what are the perceptions that can really drive share for you? So if you're going to have a singular idea, if you're going to really focus on something, what is it that you want to focus on and what is it that you can focus on that can really drive share for you versus your competitors? And the second one, thinking about experiences and pain points, is which of the experiences that you currently provide or experiences that you currently even don't provide are the ones that are going to most drive loyalty with your customers? So in some ways, there's, there's sort of two sides to this. One, a, an acquisition side of thinking about, well, of these perceptions I'm going to have about my brand out there, if I'm going to focus on one, what's the one that can really drive preference for me? And then once I've, I've hopefully communicated that, if I think about the experience that my consumer has or my customer has, what's the one, what are the touch points that are really going to most drive loyalty that I have to make sure that I'm actually doing something truly fantastic and differentiated? And, um, you know, aligned to that, you see here we have methodologies. One is called eye-opener that really looks at what can drive share from a preference standpoint for brands and pinpoint that looks at um, customer experience and looks at, well, which, which of the experiences can actually most drive loyalty? And we think that those are actually quite key in in understanding how to define a brand and set it up to, to deliver simple experiences. Um, you know, based on once you know your audience and know your customer, you want to articulate a simpler brand. And there, there are really two sides to this. There's um, having a brand really aligned to, to a common purpose that everyone internally and that externally understands and is aware of. Um, and articulating that in a simple, clear, and believable way. 
Um, and then linked to that and to delivering on that, aligning the portfolio of services or products, how the, how the brand expresses what it has and does in a way that is simple to that purpose so that people don't have to um, think through how they navigate the portfolio. And that's what we've seen in many of the um, brands that are seen as complex versus the ones that are seen as simple. Their offerings are often hard to decipher for, con for consumers. People don't understand where to find a service or what the breadth of services are or see the services as having been defined more for the benefit of the company than for their benefit. So it's really about how do you show a portfolio in a way that is actually easy to navigate, easy to understand, and aligned to, to what consumers are looking for and to what their needs are. And finally, and maybe most importantly, um, given that simplicity isn't just a, a one-off moment in time, but is something that you have to work at and that you have to um, do for the long term uh, as an ongoing program, you have to have a plan. It's, um, it's actually not something that you can just do once and then think it's fixed and walk away from. You have to have it be a sustained effort within a company, within a brand, um, and something that actually has an ongoing long-term action plan um, around it. And so one of the things that we often do with clients or even with um, you know, brands when we first start working with them is to come together um, for a simplicity workshop. It helps um, our clients to, to um, get a handle on what their gaps, what their needs are, what potentially some quick wins can be, what are things that are going to require longer term work. It also helps to get organizations aligned um, to a common mission and a common goal around simplicity and, and simplifying experiences. Um, and it helps to, to then also know how to prioritize where to invest. Back to, to what I was telling you about earlier regarding um, our pinpoint research that looks at you know, which experiences can most drive loyalty. That's, that's a potential input, for example, to, as to knowing where to invest. But um, often you can't do everything. You definitely can't do everything all at once. So it's um, useful to actually have uh, an incremental plan knowing here are the things that we think um, can be low investment but pay, have, have big payoff in the short term. Here are things that we know are going to be longer term investments and are going to take a longer term to, to come to fruition. So that's an, an overview of um, really of our findings this year. Um, as uh, Margaret told you earlier, you can um, use the hashtag SimplicityPays to uh, either ask us questions or share your thoughts regarding the, the findings. We also have um, a fantastic uh, online experience. And I can say fantastic because I'm, I'm not the one who created this. It was others on the team. And um, it's, a, it's a great website where you can explore the findings, do comparisons between um, different companies or different industries or different brands. Uh, and it's at simplicityindex.com. Um, and uh, it gives you even further uh, insight into, into some of the findings I was giving you some top line um, overviews of today. So I guess I think we, we're going to look and see if we have some questions or Margaret, I don't know if you've seen some questions. Yes, thank you, Brian. A number of questions have come in. Uh, one theme is questions around the methodology. So let's explore that one, Brian. Um, beginning with, how are the simplicity scores calculated? Firstly, by industry, and secondly, by brand. Sure. No, that's a that's a great question. Um, so uh, consumers rate um, in first they uh, rate industries on a number of attributes that range from how typically painful or not they find their interactions within. Um, that industry, how complex or simple they find communications within that industry, how approachable that industry is, so on, on a variety of attributes, they, um, they express um, how simple or not they feel the experience is within an industry. Um, and then we calculate a, an industry score that actually also factors into ultimately the brand scores um, because 
we believe that a brand from a complex industry, no matter how simple it is, can likely not be as simple as a brand from a really simple industry. So, so the industry score actually also factors into the brand score. But we then have respondents um, express whether they're a aware and familiar with brands, whether they actually use uh, qualify as users of a brand, um, and then we have them rate the brand as um, either more complex, simpler, or at parity um, versus its peers in terms of the experiences, um, communications, products, and services that it provides. And um, based on that rating, we look at both balancing the user ratings versus the non-user ratings, because we typically actually see users um, often rate brands higher than non-users, so we don't want to give any brand the advantage from having more users, so we make sure to balance those ratings out, giving slightly stronger weight to the user ratings. We also factor the standard deviation within the ratings, uh, giving a brand that has a more consistent ex uh, experience uh, a plus versus brands that have a greater spread of, of ratings. Um, and then we also look at the difference between the user and non-user ratings, um, giving, again, a benefit to, to when user and non-user ratings are more aligned and giving a definite, uh, not that this happens actually all that often, but if a brand has, for example, more negative user ratings than non-user ratings, um, that brand um, gets a, an added sort of negative to its score. So um, it, it, the, the index is actually then comprised, calculated from, uh, from a compendium of those scoring mechanics. Next question is an easy one. How can I get a copy of the report? Um, well, so as you saw, uh, as I told you earlier, at uh, simplicityindex.com, you can uh, explore it online. However, we also um, have a PDF that you can download um, uh, through that site. Um, and we also have print copies that are actually, I think, uh, in the process of being printed, but that we are you know, happy to send people if you send us your information, we can, we can also mail you a print copy when those come in. And you can follow those links and the conversation online today and going forward using the hashtag SimplicityPay. A little more detail on the questions, Brian. Is there any further elaboration you can provide on what are the kind of questions respondents were asked? Um, well, I mean, again, they were so so they were asked to rate in industries. So, for example, they saw um, let's say health insurance, and they were asked to rate health insurance on a number of attributes that I described. Then, when they were asked to rate brands, it was on a simple this one simple question as to how much simpler or more complex they felt the brand's experiences, communications, products, and services were versus their peers. Um, just prior to that, we had also asked the question to to assess familiarity and or usage with the brand. Obviously, we did not want people rating brands they were not aware of or not, not familiar with. Um, so that, that was, the, that was the, the mechanic from a question standpoint. And then once they rated a brand as either particularly complex or simple, um, they were asked an open end, so asking why they had rated uh, a brand as complex or simple. So we have... Um, which we've incorporated into some of the findings you find in the report, but we actually have a lot richer data still at a brand level looking at um, you know, what actually consumers said across the world about that brand from a point of view of simplicity or complexity. So if we turn back to the quadrants, there's some questions on where some brand brands rank. The first question is, which segment or quadrant does Aldi fall into in the Simplicity Index chart? Well, we didn't put all of the brands. We, we put a representative uh, just set of brands in the, um, in the chart that I, I showed you earlier. Um, if I, I, I can't speak, I'd have to go back and look at the data because I don't have it in front of me. Um, but I, Aldi you know, was rated as the number one brand in terms of simplicity. I would have to, to go back and remind myself to see where it fell from a, a premium standpoint. Um. Okay, Brian. Um, another methodology question. How many brands were rated in total? I 
think the number there, if my recollection is, it was in the region of 580 or, or that. Yes, I think it was, I mean, it's basically in, in every country, uh, not counting disruptors, actually, so they, they were in addition to that. So in every country, we had 125 brands, pretty much, it, it, sometimes it was 120, but it's somewhere between 120 to 125, picking the top five brands from a present standpoint, meaning from a likelihood that people were going to be aware and familiar with them in um, 25 categories, um, you know, the, what we call the sort of 25 industries. Now, some of those brands, each brand list was come up with by country in the sense that we, we looked at it country by country. Some of these brands were global, some were local, meaning that they only existed in their one country. Brands qualified for the global list when they were rated in, the, in more than one country. Um, and so in total, I think it did add up to about this 500 and 60 or 500 and some brands. And just to be clear for the purpose of listeners, there is in the report a global listing, a global ranking, and there are rankings for each of the regions that Brian mentioned at the outset, um, how these brands did in their markets. Brian, a clarifying question. The methodology for the study, online panel. Oh, yes. But it was, so, so yes, it was an online panel of uh, people recruited in each country to be representative of the, of the population. Folks are also asking for examples of brands that have embraced simplicity without compromising on what has been described as the hygiene factors or the requisites in a particular industry to be credible with customers. So obviously, in the world of simplicity, you're making choices. Is there a brand that springs to mind that you think has done well in that respect? Well, I think it is. That is. A, it's an interesting question because um, there are brands, for example, in financial services right now, um, like Betterment or Simple the Bank, for example, uh, is another one that comes to mind. Um, and Simple the Bank, actually, we put in a disrupted this, but we didn't get we couldn't find enough people who were who were users to, to actually get a, a score on them but um, which leads me to think that it can be an issue in some categories in the sense that for example leading with simplicity in financial services even though um, it's a real need because it's a it's an industry that's seen as unnecessarily complex and the consumers complain about its complexity at the same time if simplicity is the only offer, um, it potentially doesn't actually um, completely convince people because they're still worried, for example, about where they're putting their money and how trustworthy or solid the institution is. So in some ways, they, even though they have negative perceptions regarding some of the major players, they still um, have some trust issues, let's say, with going with a startup uh, in terms of where they're going to put their savings or their investments. So it's not that simplicity is the, if you will, one dimension that is the only dimension that matters to, to anyone choosing any brand. It's just that we believe it's actually one a uh, something that brands have to pay attention to because otherwise they lose trust. I mean, one thing that we've seen is brands that deliver complex experiences, people believe that's on purpose. They don't think that that's something that's by accident. They think that the brands that they see as complex are actually trying to be complex to deceive them. So in order to have trust, it's, it's essential to focus on simplicity. And per the disruptors, simplicity can actually really change the game and can enable you to suddenly change a marketplace and, and um, you know, change leaders into laggards. Now, that doesn't mean that it's going to be as easy in banking as it is in, for example, car services or, or disrupting taxis. Okay. Thank you for that, Brian. A specific question coming through here on Aldi. How is Aldi ranked ahead of Google on the top 10 global brand list, as Google is a much more global brand than Aldi? Well, so, I mean, the, the, you know, again, the, the criteria for being on the global list is to be in, in more than one country. So it's not to be in all of the countries. Um, and Aldi is in actually quite a few countries. I mean, it's, um, it is throughout Europe, and uh, it actually is in the U.S. even now, although um, 
you know, in a smaller way than is some of the, the competitors. Um, but that's what qualified it to be a global brand. And then in terms of how it scores, um, it, you know, it, it um, got rated as simpler than not compared to Google. But if we looked at its aggregate ratings, it, it did better than Google did. I mean, Google did well too. It's just, you know, Aldi happened to, to do better. Okay, so thank you for the questions. I'm also watching Simplicity Pays on the Twitter stream. If you have further questions, you may please use the hashtag Simplicity Pays. Um, question about the recording. Will a recording be available? Yes, a recording of this webinar together with the slides that Brian presented will be available within 24 hours. Watch Twitter and that hashtag at, uh, at Siegel Gale hashtag simplicity pays, or for those of you who registered using your email address, you will receive an email linking you to this slide deck as well as to the report website that Brian referenced earlier in the discussion. I'll give it one more minute. It looks like we have addressed all of the questions you have for this time. One more may be coming through. No, I think. I think we've captured it. Well, thank you all for your attention, for joining us, and for engaging in the conversation. A reminder, Siegel & Gale, we're a global strategic branding firm. We offer a range of services from research to design to content creation and strategy. We help some of the world's leading brands, and we've been doing so for the past 40 years. We would be delighted to hear from you if you are intrigued by the study, or if you work at a brand and would like to engage our services. Here is the information to find us on social, at Siegel Gale. I've been mentioning the hashtag Simplicity Pays. We consistently publish articles using that hashtag on many dimensions of simplicity and branding. Here is my contact information as well as Brian's and a link to the report. Thank you once again, and thank you, Brian. Thank you, Margaret.